I often um, use my second talk at a Metals Investor Forum to talk about the stocks that I own here and why I own them, which was a tempting thing to do because I love running through that, the pressure of, running, of explaining the investment rationale for each stock in just two minutes. But instead today I'm going to talk about uranium. Um, uranium requires quite a bit of explanation if one wants to sort of understand what's happening in the, in the space and uh, what might happen from here. And so I thought I would just use this opportunity to go through that, even though none of the companies that are up here with me today are uranium companies. I'm nonetheless going to talk about uranium um, because I'm, I'm pretty excited about the space. So. Um, the uranium story, uh, the reason that uranium is exciting today, starts back in 2016. So, I mean, we all remember, remember Fukushima, we remember how the spot market got flooded, and the uranium market was in dire straits. By the time we got to 2016, the spot market was completely flooded with excess pounds, and um, it just didn't work. The, the, the price... Um, the spot price was far below the cost of production for just about every mine in the world. A few in situ recovery mines were maybe making money, but that's about it. What's cool is that the uranium producers of the world decided to do something about it as a group, which is not super common. Um, so they got together and decided to address oversupply. Um, they closed mines, they reduced output, and they supported sequestering. So they sequestering being um, groups buying physical uranium and just tucking it away, making it unavailable to the market, hiding it away, um, and thereby reducing the amount that's just sloshing around in the market. And what's, it, it worked. So you can see the terrible spot price decline on one side of the chart there. Um, and then you can see from 2016 through to 2020, you did get some gradual price improvements, right? As there were these production cuts and this sequestering, we got some slow improvement. Then COVID hit. Who could have seen that? Uh, and that shuttered some of the world's largest uranium mines, and so the spot price um, responded really favorably to that. Um, and then it, it, you know, that established a new level, and it traded sideways along that level from uh, the middle of 2020, sort of, until quite recently. So that's where we were. Um, so the price responded to this sector-wide effort to change the situation. Um, but we were still, the prices were still weak. They certainly weren't enough to encourage new mines to be built. They were, to, they were too low. And utilities were still not at the contracting table. Uh, and so what, what I mean by that is utilities, the, nucle the operators of nuclear reactors, weren't coming to the table to sign new long-term contracts, um, which are one of the things that give a lot of certainty to price um, looking forward. So there still needed to be more. Well, more sort of showed up with gusto in the middle of August. And that is um, back in April, Sprott, which uh, one arm of Sprott owns a lot, um, operates several funds that give investors exposure to commodities, direct exposure to commodities, right? So they have a silver uh, trust, they have a gold trust, and they, ho they hold the commodity, they don't um, uh, offer it out, they, they hold the commodity and so you, so you can have access to physical through their trusts. They decided to do that with uranium. And they did it by buying uranium participation, which was a physical trust, but it was a very tightly regulated one that was very, pretty limited because of those rule, its own rules about what it could do, so it was a really small version of a commodity trust. They took it over. Uh, to make it bigger and to make it better. And so the concept is whatever money they have, they use it to buy physical uranium and just stockpile it away. And so it took from April until August for them to jump through all the regulatory hoops. And on August 17th, they launched. Um, and they had an at-the-market financing, which is just a financing where they issue shares at the current share price based on interest. They were allowed to raise up to 300 million in that at the market financing, and in the first three and a half weeks, they raised a, a big chunk of that, 245 million, shoved it all into buying physical uranium, and the spot price responded like you wouldn't believe. I'll show that on the next chart. And so by September 10th, they just upsized, they upsized by just a titch. They upsized their at the market capacity to 1.3 billion dollars. So they did not, they're not holding their punches. This is something that they are leaning into very hard. At this point, they have already raised $900 million through that at-the-market financing, so there's been significant interest uh, 
from those who want to position with exposure to physical uranium, and so they have spent $900 million buying physical uranium and sequestering it away. SPUT, which is a hilarious acronym, but nonetheless that is the acronym, SPUT is not the first fund out there to stockpile U308 as a bet on higher prices. Um, the sequestering that I talked about before, funds have been doing this for some time. Yellow cake is a good example. Um, but it is, it entered the space with really good timing and with very significant scale, like we haven't seen before. And if you put together the scale and the timing, then you get impact. The lower chart there in red shows the spot price, and in blue shows Sprott, Sprott's daily uh, uranium purchases. So you can see that the spot price has been tracking those daily purchases pretty darn well. It was really exciting in that first month, right? You could see the spot price of uranium go from under 30 bucks to almost 50 bucks. Uh, it was like 25 to 50, it basically doubled um, because of Sprott's buying from the middle of August to the middle of September. So that was a very dramatic move. Nothing goes straight to the moon. It certainly had to set, settle back from there, and it did. Um, but the buying continues, and you can see the response to that buying right there. And cumulatively, the, the chart on the top adds those blue bars together into the red line on the, on the top chart, and it shows that they have now bought 20 million pounds of U308 that they have tucked away and made unavailable to the market. Okay, so that's been what's happened recently. That all sits in a context um, of growing demand uh, that has for a long time now and will continue to outstrip um, primary supply. That doesn't mean that there's a huge supply gap because there's a lot of secondary supply in the uranium market, but it's the, if you add together primary supply and secondary supply, you just get enough some years and you don't have enough other years going forward from here. Um, and those, to make sure that there is enough uranium, you need more mines to come online. Uh, the secondary supplies are drying up, especially if more of this sequestering occurs, right? The sequestering is just taking pounds away from the market. So the more of those pounds that disappear, the bigger the gap is that's going forward. And you can see that year to date, investment funds and junior miners who have also piled into the sequestering game, people like Energy Fuels and Uranium Energy, they have bought wax of physical uranium and just tucked them away. So collectively, they've hidden away 39 million pounds. That doesn't include what, um, what SPUT has done. So those have, all together, there's now, you know, 76 million pounds of uranium that's just hidden away from the market. This is why uranium is in, uh, has solidified so much, because all of that excess that was in the market has now been locked away. Um, so this gap is real. When you look at primary supply, which is supply that's coming out of a mine, it's nowhere near enough to meet demand. Like I say, secondary supply fills that gap sometimes, um, but not if it keeps getting siphoned off, and therefore the gap, to bridge the gap, we need new mines, and new mines require higher prices. Now why is demand, so the, the other part of this is that demand absolutely keeps rising, and demand is rising because of China and other places, but China. That's like the, the factor that really matters here is China. I mean, here's other places where demand increases matter. For sure, the US, um, since the change of administration, uh, has boosted incentives for clean energy with specific mention of nuclear uh, multiple times. The EU is doing things that suggest it will encourage France and Germany to slow or stop their nuclear retirement plans. You know, India and Russia, absolutely also um, important players here with the plans that they have. Those are a little bit farther dated because the planned and proposed reactors there, those still take perhaps a decade to, to come to fruition or the first of them. Um, but you know, they're building as well. But when you look at that chart at the bottom, what matters is the blue thing that's growing at the base of the chart and that's China. This chart here shows just China's increase in nuclear generation capacity from now up until 2035. And last week, it was last week, uh, there was an article in Bloomberg that said a bunch of things that were not new. It just was a very, it was a well-written article that summarized China's nuclear 
energy ambitions. And so things like 150 reactors in the next 15 years, which is more than the rest of the world has built for 35 years. They want to increase their nuclear generating capacity to 200 gigawatts by 2035. That powers 12 Beijings. Like, Beijing is not a small city. That powers 12 of those cities. So this is a, this is a program of real scale, and that's why China is the one that matters. And I emphasize that because there remains and will always be questions about acceptance of nuclear energy. Uh, and that's, that's the reality. But China is the story that matters here, and China is doing this. And they've made it every time they have a five-year plan, they only, they only lean more into nuclear. So this is the real force, and it really matters. And I think the fact that uranium stocks jumped 10 days ago, like, it was actually quite surprising. I didn't know what was going on. The spot price hadn't moved. I was like, why are all these uranium stocks up today? And it was because of this Bloomberg article. So I think that just underlines to people. It helped people. It brought together the facts and made them say, okay, this is, a, this is something that's, that we can't deny. This is a real thing. Now, I talked about the contracting side of things. Obviously, the, the big picture game here is empty the spot market, which forces utilities to come to the contracting table. Uh, utilities, that means signing deals with uranium producers to buy the uranium that they need for longer periods of time at set prices. Um, and those matter because... Uranium producers will not sign new, significant new supply contracts at prices that make them lose money. That's poor business. And now that they're in a strengthening market, they're not going to sign such contracts. And so uh, a raft of new long-term contracts is one of the key things that those who watch the uranium market are really paying attention to and have for quite a few years to say, okay, now the utilities are leaning in. And if they start signing contracts that are above even this newly increased spot price, that will be yet another surge of excitement in the space. And it sort of has to happen because the uncovered requirements for nuclear reactors have gotten very significant. That's what these charts show, and it's a bit complicated to wrap your head around initially, or like or in, a, in a short moment, we can talk about it more after. But at the end of the day, reactors, you can't turn a reactor off, not like a, not like a natural gas plant where you can just, oh, prices are high, we'll just turn this thing off for a while and wait for prices to come back down. You can't do that with, with reactors. You have to have your fuel on hand. And the other interesting aspect is that utilities have generally acted like lemmings. So when one of them starts signing contracts, they all go, oh, I don't want to be the one left without uranium. And they all rush to sign contracts, which is why there's a huge surge. The blue chart there shows how many long-term contracts were signed in the peak of the last uranium market. Like at absolutely the worst time from a utility for their cost of fuel perspective. They all rushed and signed contracts at the peak of the last market. So that's one of the other reasons why people really watch contracting because it sort of pours fuel on the fire as a uranium market is heating up. Now, I, I don't know how exciting this uranium market will get, obviously. I don't have a crystal ball. We can look at the last ones. When they have happened in significant ways, uranium bull markets put gold bull markets to shame. They can go really nuts, right? Because utilities have to secure supply, they don't have a choice. Um, they pile in as a group. And then speculators have seen this playbook before, so they add to the pressure. And then it's just a small market. And we know that just like a tight share structure, small markets, lots of focused interest in a small market makes for big moves. And so that's why uranium markets can be so dramatic. Then uranium equities are even more dramatic than the price of uranium. And that's the small market thing redoubled. So it's not leverage that drives uranium equities ridiculously high in a strong uranium market. Leverage is that a gold miner makes more per ounce because their costs are basically the same. Every increased dollar on the gold price means go straight to their bottom line. That's, the lev that's what leverage usually refers to in the mining space. It's not really leverage that sends uranium equities to the moon in a uranium market. It's a lack of stocks. There's been, it's been such a terrible market for so very long that there's hardly any stocks out there anymore. And so any investor who decides they want exposure to uranium you know, has three dozen stocks they can buy? I mean, maybe it's four now, but it's a very small number of stocks that, um, into which they have to pour because that's just all that there is um, after such a long, dark market. I wanted to comment this all 
the big new surge of interest in uranium started with spot and creating this big new sequestering force in the market. Um, it, it deserves a little bit of, a, another bit of attention here. Is the presence of a real way to have exposure to physical uranium going to add to the pressure or change the pressure? I'm not sure, but in past bull markets, passive funds just didn't really have a way to participate in the uranium bull market. Because UPC, like I said, it was very small, it was very rule constrained, it, it wasn't a good vehicle, um, and it lacked liquidity. So passive funds, the first thing they need is liquidity. They need to be able to enter and exit easily. So they couldn't get exposure to physical through a fund, it didn't exist, and miners were sort of debt laden and political, it wasn't really an area that passive funds would go to. But now we have this physical uranium trust that is, you know, very liquid and very large, and so Passive funds can certainly particip participate in spot. And then just last week, Sprott made yet another move. They acquired URNM, which is an ETF of uranium miners, and they plan on make, doing sort of a similar transition that they did with turning uranium participation into spot. They plan to do that similar sort of playbook, turning UR, I, never, I still don't even know what the acronym is, URNM into a larger, more liquid uh, fund of uranium miners that passive money can play. So it just means that the algorithms and computers that manage passive money will have the opportunity to play this market as well. Um, and I don't know what that will do, but that's a, that's a factor that's new in this market relative to previous markets. And I'm not going to tell, like I say, I don't know where this market's going to go. Uh, a very common question today is, have I already missed the move, right? The uranium price has almost doubled already, so have I already missed the move? I think that there's a lot of, there's a good amount of room left to run in this market. I'm not saying that uranium is going to hit whatever it did there, $150 a pound like it did back in 2007, which was crazy. But I do think that we have a lot of room to go above $45 or wherever we are today. Um, and we have, while we certainly have seen interest in uranium stocks, I think that the, um, the reaction to that Bloomberg article 10 days ago, I think suggests that it's fairly new, right? Uh, that the in investor interest in uranium is still pretty new, uh, and that only emphasizes to me that there's more room left to go in this uranium market. So that's what I'm gonna say about uranium. That's my wrap up slide for all my talks. Um, like I say, none of the companies up here are uranium companies, but I wanted to go through that logic because like, there's a lot of components in play and history that's needed to sort of understand what's happening in uranium today. Mm -hmm.